Can we prevent war? Can human societies abolish war? Is it possible to establish some kind of perpetual peace? Or is war is war caused by bad people, bad leaders, and if we get rid of them, we could get rid of war? Or is war part of the human condition? To, to answer all these con- uh, questions, we need to ask what are the causes of war? Why? And uh, this is a question that is answered in a fantastic book by Richard Overy that I'm going to introduce you to today to help you make sense of this world at war. Why is human history a world of war? What are the eight causes of war? I'm Jeff Rich. This is The Burning Archive. Thanks so much for joining me here uh, where we explore Uh, current day events with world history and try to make sense of a puzzling world with quality world history and literature. Uh, The question of why war has been asked by thinkers over millennia. It's been asked by philosophers such as Immanuel Kant. It has been asked by scientists, Albert Einstein. It's been asked by psychologists, by poets, in the great epics like the Mahabharata and by international relations scholars like John Mearsheimer, who I recently did a video on. It's even been asked by economists uh, and also by many historians. After all, history is so often a story of battles and war. Jeffrey Blaney, who is a great Australian historian who I studied with in the 1980s, wrote a brilliant book in the 1970s called The Causes of War. And that's still widely studied in military uh, colleges, in national security studies in the United States of America, and even featured in a recent RAND Corporation report on Uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, But the latest and best history, I think, the best history book, really just off the, uh, just been published in the last month or so on the question of what are the causes of war has been written by the British historian Richard Overy. Uh, He's one of the world's leading military historians Uh, And his answer is clear, unequivocal, and, uh, but not very comforting. War is normal. It is an enduring feature of human history. Uh, We might dream of a perpetual peace, uh, but war will always be with us. It has been part of not just our Uh, last hundred or thousand years of history. It's been part of our deep evolutionary history. Uh, But war is not caused by one thing. It is too diverse. It is it is too complex, a human phenomenon for that. Uh, There is no one cause uh, that a magic bullet can uh, lead to the abolition of war like the abolition of slavery, as many humanitarian advocates have long dreamt of. It's not a very comforting thought, but there is a silver lining, which I will get to towards the end of this video. There is not one cause, but many, and they are a combination of both human nature and human motives, human agency. So we can act on the causes of war, even if they're ever present among us. And that means there may be many ways we can all act to prevent war and promote a little more peace. Uh, We do actually have some choices. Overy, in his book Why War, systematically reviews the many explanations of the causes of war offered by many disciplines and scholars over millennia. 
He says his aim of the book is to examine the ways in which warfare has been explained by the major disciplines, the major disciplines of the human sciences. He assesses these causes against the very best, most up-to-date historical and scientific uh, evidence and from across time and place. He goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. He looks at place wars that have occurred all around the world. He distills these explanations into eight causes that can be simply grouped, I guess, into either external or internal factors, or if you like, into human nature and human motivation or historical motivations. Let us take a look at how this fantastic quality world history book by Richard Overy, Why War, helps us make sense of a world at war. First of all, who is Richard Overy? Well, he is a British military historian who has taught at Cambridge, King's College and Exeter, beginning his career in the early to mid-1970s. Uh, he has specialised on the Second World War and his work has been praised as among the best in the world. His publications are extensive and he was the product of a school of uh, historian, military historians, historians of war at Cambridge University that really uh, reshaped how military history, the history of war was done, made it a much, much richer uh, discipline, a real genuine part of history in general, not just an adjunct to um, military training. The concept of a military historian will excite some people. There's a lot of military history channels out there on YouTube uh, and a put off some other people. Uh, but I would say that Overy is a wonderful balance of both those or types of or appeal to both audiences. He is extraordinarily detailed and uh, um, scholarly in his treatment of the military side, I guess, of military history. But he is also humane and broad-minded in his perspective of the history side of military history. He really treats it as a holistic human experience. Uh, and from a world historical point of view. Uh, so I guess a bonus of this video, as well as explaining what the causes of war are, uh, to point out to you one of the best historians you can read on the history of war, uh, and especially uh, on the topic of World War II. Richard Overy in the last couple of years has published an extraordinary book called Blood and Ruins, The Last Imperial War, 1931 to 1945. Uh, and this really reframes what we know as the Second World War in a much broader context. Uh, he reframes the narrative of that war and discusses themes such as mobilising the population for war, war economies, arguments about just wars, civilian wars, emotional geography of war, crimes and atrocities, and the nature of the world order or international system that was created by that war, the way in which uh, empires were replaced by a world of nations or a world of empires was replaced by a world of nations. Indeed, he has spoken of how that book uh, has been, was influenced by how his writing of Blood and Ruins, which is uh, uh, absolutely a recommended reading for all viewers, uh, it was influenced by a book I often recommend on the Burning Archive channel, uh, John Darwin's After Tamerlan. Blood and Ruins really takes a global perspective on World War II and will shake up a lot of the common beliefs you might have about this, uh, this, this war, which in some ways is our own sort of mythic war of the ancients in the contemporary world. Overy's also edited an illustrated history of World War II. He's written on Russia's experience of the war. He's written a history of 
uh, war in total through a hundred battles across the world. He's even prepared for the Times a list of the 50 top events in world history. Uh, And so you can see his latest book, uh, Why War, perhaps coming towards the end of his uh, active writing life, maybe, uh, has summarised all he has learned from a lifetime of the study of war uh, in world history and his examination in depth over 50 years of uh, one of the most horrendous events of world history, that is World War II, uh, one of the most violent events in world history. Of course, he will have his biases and his particular you know, ideas and frameworks, but unlike some historians I've commented on on the channel, I think Overy is a true scholar. Uh, and doesn't really get overly drawn into commentary on current day politics, current day events. Uh, So really what I'm going to share with you today is an overview of perhaps the very, very best uh, independent, objective, um, scholarly, well-informed, clearly written account of the causes of war that is available to anyone who is watching this this video. I'm not really presenting myself as the authority on these causes of war, so you can hold off on those comments, but I am merely the messenger and my main aim is really to encourage you to read this book and spread the word about this important and helpful book that uh, reflects on an aspect of the human experience that is terrible and hard to think about, but is ever present, that is war. War, the eight causes of war are really identified uh, by Richard Overy in his book, Why War, in two broad categories. One related to human nature or external conditions. So let's look at those four causes first. And in a relationship to looking at human nature, uh, Overy reflects that war has been a persistent feature of human societies. Uh, there have been many, I guess, myths of um, noble savages and primitive peasts and all this sort of thing. But um, what Richard Overy concludes on his, uh, uh, you know, best available review of the evidence, lethal intergroup violence is evident even before the first large-scale sedentary communities or the first states. The evidence is now clear on this, and Overy looks at Australian Aboriginal communities, tribal hunters in New Guinea, and tribal inhabitants of North America, and what the archaeological, anthropological sort of record tends to show. He notes that different cultures pursue violence in distinct, sometimes unique ways, sometimes unique ways. Early warfare is self-evidently not the same as warfare between large modern states, but the scale is relative and the proximate causes and aims can be strikingly similar. Despite myths amongst um, some writers that war comes with uh, agriculture or the coming of the state uh, or capitalism and imperialism, all the evidence suggests that war has been uh, a persistent, variable feature of all human societies. So war is part of our nature. Uh, It is a way of coping with our survival and Overy looks at four external causes that reflect our mixed nature as both a, uh, as a cultural animal and both biologically um, informed and culturally sh- uh, biologically shaped and or biologically determined and culturally shaped um, uh, actor in a real physical environment. The four uh, 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 causes he looks at are biology, psychology, anthropology, and ecology. 
on biology. So what is in our bodies? What is in our genes? What is the nature of the human animal that drives it on to war? This is a question that has been explored by many writers, including uh, the famous sociobiologist Edward Wilson who looked at human nature and uh, made all sorts of comparisons with ant societies and all that sort of stuff. It's been looked at by Jane Goodall and her examination of chimpanzees as well as many, many other uh, you know, students of animal behaviour. And it's also looked at particularly um, by a writer, William Hamilton, who Overy does focus on. He notes that uh, a lot of the debate about how the human animal, how how inherent biology drives us on to war, tries to make a distinction between cooperation and conflict, um, warfare and uh, social bonding, let's say. But indeed, these are not necessarily um, opposites or polar opposites. Violence and cooperation are not opposites, but two elements of an evolutionary package hominins developed over hundreds of thousands of years to produce survival and reproductive benefits. It's a brilliant discussion of this very contentious issue. His conclusion is that um, it seems most likely that humans have adapted biologically to engage in violence when necessary to preserve the gene pool and secure reproductive success to make sure, you know, our children survive us. He notes that uh, warfare is on this reading, not in our genes, but for our genes. It's fighting to keep our band alive. The second cause of war is what's in our minds, what's our psychology. Uh, And here, uh, uh, Overy looks at uh, Freud, traumatic experiences, various interpretations of childhood driving people on to, you know, fight aggression, to be aggressive and all that sort of thing. But he largely focuses on one particular aspect that has driven the psychology of war uh, very commonly, and that is our tendency to uh, draw contrasts between them and us, and particularly when that them and us thinking, that in-group, out-group thinking draws us into actual organised violence. It drives us on to dehumanise and to demonise uh, other groups of humans, other nations, other peoples, other cultures, other races. And of course, Richard Overy's study of the Second World War, the great, the last imperial war, provides him ample, ample evidence to uh, explore this, this regrettable tendency of them and us thinking, which we see even today in the conflicts that surround us in our world at war today. We all know this. We all know the terrible temptation we all have to demonise and to treat an enemy as in some way subhuman. But this psychological cause of war interacts with the biological imperative to secure reproductive success, to keep the band going. He writes, the biological imperative to fight when needed was reinforced by an evolved psychology that divided the human world into them and us, justifying intraspecific killing, that is, killing specific uh, op- specific groups within our own kind, intraspecific killing, while creating a psychological predis predisposition to accept collective violence as a normative social responsibility 
particularly for men, the role of men as warriors. The third big cause of war is found in anthropology and relates to culture. Here, Richard Overy explores the work of uh, anthropologists who believe that perhaps there were um, noble savage cultures which were could do without war and aggress- aggression like Margaret Mead and Malinowski. Uh, and he explores the uh, extraordinary evidence that has accumulated over the last 50 years that uh, gives us a much, much richer understanding of the anthropology, the archaeological record, the cultural history of war. Uh, and he finds that there really are no such societies without war, but there have been many different kinds of culture of war. He looks at Rome, he looks at the Mayans, he looks at uh, the Aztecs, um, and he asks, does culture, he explores how culture causes war and the extent to which culture celebrates war as well, including in more recent societies, uh, and including in our own modern cultures. And he notes that uh, building on both the biological and the um, psychological drivers of the causes of war, uh, the reproductive success and then the them versus us instinct or, or the, the, the pattern of them versus us thinking, the validation of a certain role of a moral, of a male warrior uh, to protect the tribe. There was the development of culture and symbols and language which reinforced this. He writes, it was possible to invest warfare with more meaning as a manifestation of cosmological belief or cultures in which warfare was viewed as both necessary and valued. The co-evolution of culture and biology for most of the long human past created conditions within which nature and nurture together, not either one or the other, reinforced the resort to violence when uh, regarded as necessary or advantageous. And then the fourth and final uh, cause of war within this category of human nature, if you like, or external causes, was ecology, the environment. Here he considers issues like climate wars or or uh, wars induced by um, uh, whether they're weather patterns or environmental change, drought, scarcity of various uh, animals and water and that sort of thing has led to war. In the past, not so long ago, there were many predictions that the twenty uh, the twenty first century would be an era of water wars that's the whole premise i guess of that that uh, book dune um but uh he, he does explore these too and he explores how the natural environment in which humans evolved supplied external imperatives to act violently when ecological resources were depleted and human competition for them intensified but the natural causes if you like the external causes of war cannot explain how certain wars occur and how particular incidents in wars occur or why they take the particular course they do humans act that have their own agency in acting in history and in war And the next four causes of war that Overy explores explore these kind of human motives. He looks at how humans proactively decided to wage war, 
not because they were driven to by their biology, their instincts, their psychology, their culture or their um, uh, environmental conditions, but for tangible internal motivations, internal drivers of human action. They were conscious agents in the pursuit of of objectives that also varied widely in time and place, but uh, can be uh, summarised coherently as four main causes of war. And these uh, motives are broken down by uh, Overy as these. Resources, belief, power and security. He notes that these four reasons are not necessarily mutually exclusive. One can fight a crusade for belief uh, and also enjoy looting whoever one's fighting against. One uh, can um, uh, seek to secure another's resources while also Uh, trying to improve your internal security. But these four categories Overy does describe as universal, though they vary in historical circumstances. They're not just random chaos, and nor is uh, security dilemmas, if you like, the same in every situation. What causes insecurity what causes a struggle for power, what causes clashes in beliefs will change enormously over time. His section on resources is a fascinating discussion of resources war and it of resources wars and this is also very pertinent to so many wars we've seen over the last Uh, 30 or 40 years, it's often claimed that, you know, war is a racket or the, you know, the the wars in Western Asia led by the United States were all about the oil or control of the resources or that uh, war is uh, driven on by the resource uh, interests of the military industrial complex. And those are factors Uh, But ultimately, he uh, says they are not exclusive, uh, they're not the only factors. And looking at all eight of these causes enables us to see how in, in every individual situation, we can see aspects of all eight of these causes. But the greed for others' resources is a persistent cause of war. Then he looks at belief, and here he looks at various wars for faith or ideology. He looks at the Crusades. Uh, you could also explore how, um, I guess, uh, the, is, uh, ISIS and uh, Islamic fundamentalism is similarly a form of war for a belief. You might even ask whether some of the sort of liberal rules-based order wars of the last 30 years or so are similarly um, wars conducted in pursuit of a liberal ideology. And so, again, this is a fascinating discussion of how beliefs uh, and firm conviction of beliefs, Yeats, you know, full of passionate intent, the worst are full of passionate intensity about their beliefs and drive the world on to war. The seventh cause of war, the third cause within this group of motivations, human motivations, is power asserting dominance Uh, and here um, uh, Overy explores some of the extraordinary figures who individually in their will to power if you like have driven the world to war he has studied World War II after all he has exam he wrote a book of the dictators looking at two of the dictators from World War II. And he uh, also discusses Napoleon, whose uh, 
extraordinary personality for dominance and will to power led Europe and indeed the whole world into forms of war. You could also question whether the power elite in Washington, the Washington gang, as uh, Emmanuel Todd uh, describes them, have also exhibited a similar desire for dominance, a desire expressed in the Wolfowitz Doctrine in the early 1990s that America should rule supreme, uh, that it should have full-spectrum dominance. But whatever particular case study you look at, there is no doubt that the assertion of dominance, the drive for power, has been a persistent cause of war. Then finally, he looks at the uh, question of security, the search for security. And here he brings up perhaps the first uh, philosopher to, or what, what the first, uh, uh, you know, a modern European philosopher to express the idea that the search for security is the driver of war. That is Hobbes, who famously said, you know, without a state that can organize, uh, you know, organize um, its people into. Uh, a collective band to fight against others. Life will be nasty, poor, brutish and short. Uh, and in this chapter, there is in fact a very, very helpful discussion, an in-depth examination of the discipline of security studies, the study of national security, which really has its uh, beginnings in the 1930s in America, but really got going after World War II in the context of the world, uh, the second of the Cold War, includes figures like Henry Kissinger, um, uh, Butterfield, Waltz, and um, the Australian British scholar Hedley Bull, who wrote the anarchical society, the nature of internationalism. This is effectively a brilliant account of the development of the realist school of security studies, the realist school of international relations, both in its defensive and its offensive and its old school and its new school forms. It is a deep examination of many of the assumptions that I described in my video about John Mearsheimer and whether John Mearsheimer's uh, realis realism theory is really realistic. He does in many ways uh, expose some of the limitations of realism. He makes the point uh, that uh, realist theory of security studies fits history to the model. Uh, there is no doubt that the sense, the search for security and the way in which one person's security can become another person's insecurity or another state's insecurity has been a major cause of war. But uh, Overy gives uh, some extraordinary well-grounded uh, reasons for questioning the realist theory of international relations and some of its limitations as an understanding of history. And here he, ex he explores uh, the experience of the Roman Empire, the experience of China and, you know, the Great Wall of China. Uh, it's the difficulties of maintaining frontiers in large territorial empires and he also explores perhaps the most modern uh, example of uh, a war driven, caused by issues of security, the Russia-Ukraine war. So a brilliant discussion of eight causes of war, um, biology, psychology, anthropology, ecology, and then they're all in our human nature and then 
our human motives, our human choices, our human uh, agency, resources, belief, power, and security. It all comes back to that question we began the video with. How can we prevent war? Well, we clearly on the basis of Overy's brilliant examination of history, and I really recommend people read the book. I've only been able to give you a few glimpses of the extraordinary range of uh, historical examples of war and the, the, the absolute best thinking there has been on the topic of war in this book. But he does make it clear there's no uh, likelihood anytime soon that war will disappear from human history, uh, nor that there is a single cause or a simple solution to the problem of war. He writes, the complex ways in which warfare has been shaped by natural imperatives and human agency operating in tandem means abandoning the idea that explaining warfare can be simple. Each school all of these dis different disciplines, security studies, biology, economics, um, anthropology, realist international relations, they all assert their realistic perspective, their particular field. But uh, they all reduce the complex interactions uh, of war, the complex causes of war, to oversimplified models and not such great guides to action. It's best, I think, to use a bit of quality world history like Richard Overy's Why War to try to make more sense of this world at war. There is a certainty that the face of war will change and he has a brief section towards the end of the book on how cyber war may become a more visible feature of the face of war. But war will not end. There are scant grounds for thinking that a warless world is about to emerge from the current or future international order. The causes of war have been persistent for millennia. But this, I don't think, should be seen as a counsel of despair or succumbing to the brutal Hobbesian world of the realist international theorists. The obligations to seek peace amidst war have also remained with us for centuries. There are moral obligations. They are moral obligations that we can act on both our uh, human conditioning and our uh, various motivations for conflict uh, and uh, the obligations to seek peace will remain with us just as war will over the centuries. And for each of Richard Overy's eight causes of war, I think we can respond morally in favour of peace in favour of a multipolar, pluralistic vision of peace across the world. We can tell ourselves that we do not need to wage war anymore to secure our reproductive survival. Whatever our instincts might tell us, our healthcare systems these days are much better at, in, than they were millennia ago. We can break down them versus us thinking and never descend into the dehumanization or demonization of rivals or even the cancellation of people we disagree with. We can celebrate cultures of peace and diplomacy as well as cultures of war. And aggression. We can protect the earth that sustains us all, however unequally, however fragilely 
in the face of climate change. And we can stand back from crusading beliefs and ask ourselves some questions, accept or even celebrate the plurality of beliefs, ideas, cultures, uh, aims and purposes around the world. We can limit our greed for others' resources and let them enjoy their gifts. Uh, we can constrain ambitions of greatness uh, and fantasies to be the biggest and the best, the most powerful, to be the unipolar leader of the world, to dominate the world, to control the world. And we can respect how our actions might induce fear and insecurity among those with whom we share this world. War has been with us for millennia, but so too has been advice on how to mitigate the harms of war. It has been expressed in the philosophy uh, expressed by India during its presidency of the G20 in 2023 that comes from the Sanskrit text of the Maha Upanishad, uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, One Earth, One Family, One Future. Please read Richard Overy's Why War and find your own ways to promote that deeper moral vision. Why not join me at jeffrich.substack.com uh, and you can dive more deeply into world history and literature. And uh, I'll be doing a post next Wednesday on my Substack for paid subscribers that will explore an aspect of Richard Overy's Why War. Uh, so join me now there and you'll be able to get that exclusive exploration of this really important book. Thanks for watching.